the World Health Organization and something we have warned about on this show year in, year out and being ridiculed and denigrated for it, the Global Pandemic Treaty of the WHO. Liberal Senator Alex Antic joins us. Alex, great to see you. A one-man band fighting for the freedom of this nation you are against the uh, overreach and the threat of a global pandemic treaty by the World Health Organization. Now, this week we had, or last week, the World Health Assembly, which is kind of where they all get together to, to, to push this agenda. Tell us about it, Alex. What's going on? Yeah, well, I don't know about a one-man one band, Rowan. I've got the harmonica and the drums going and the cymbals going, but uh, <laughs> uh, I wouldn't think it's quite quite as bad as that. There are a few of us, uh, Senator Good. Gerard Rennick and Senator Ralph Babbitt and Senator Good. Matt Canavan, of course, as Excellent. always, is on point. So there are a few, but, but this is worrying stuff. It's worrying that it's not making more news outside great shows like yours. Um, the mainstream media don't want to hear about this. And while we're distracted with nonsense like The Voice or whatever other issues of the day permeate the uh, Canberra political elite, uh, we are now seeing this going on in the background. And, and what we're seeing now is these amendments to the international health regulations. There was a, a suite of them, a tranche of them back in May of last year, which are about to come into effect. There's a, a 24, month, 24 to 12 month period where uh, they are adopted. Uh, and in the background to that, there are another 307 that are being no negotiated by uh, this working group on the international health regulations, which is, by the way, made up of a group of unelected bureaucrats from all over the, all over the globe. Uh, and then if that isn't worse, and it's not clear why both are needed, but in addition to those two working documents, there's also the Pandemic Treaty, which is a bigger, badder instrument. I got corrected during estimates. I called it a treaty. Turns out it's an instrument. Turns out they're exactly the same thing. So <laughs> yeah. who would have thought you'd get weasel words? Weasel words at Senate estimates. I mean, it's like going to Harvard Business School, except for bureaucrats. But anyway, uh, I digress. Uh, I chase off into the distance there and lose my train. But uh, it is frustrating because this is a massive issue. This really represents um, basically a global health autocracy brewing in our own midst um, of global surveillance, you know, digital health passes, uh, and basically the Australian pandemic response sitting in lockstep with those that created the COVID lockdown uh, hysteria in the first place. I mean, I, I just think this is, this is huge news. It's just not being told. Uh, while well, we're all uh, worried about bread and circuses here in this country. James. Well, Alex, I want to ask you about this, uh, this global pandemic treaty, because, I mean, you know, as you, you were saying, it does have all of these potential powers. They're still working on what they are. Australia had a pandemic response that was completely different to what it wound up doing. But, you know, in the books, Tony Abbott worked on it when he was health minister about what might happen. Yet it was the Morrison government, the Liberal government, that started the process of Australia getting into this treaty in the first place. So the Liberals have to answer some questions about this, don't they? Well, I, mean, I think it's I, honestly, I think this is a this is a political issue on both sides. I, I don't think that perhaps the Australian political class has understood uh, the big and bad nature of the the bureaucracy they're dealing with. And and I think there are probably many of us who 20 years ago would have thought, oh yeah, the World Health Organization, you know, they do good stuff, you know, whatever. Well, those days are over. I mean, this is not a good organization. This is an organization we should be leaving. Uh, we should be leaving yesterday. Yep. Mm -hmm. uh, and if you want to know why, have a look at their response uh, in, in the COVID pandemic. They didn't get anything right. First, it was no masks. Then it was masks. You know, first, it was no pandemic. Then they declare a pandemic. Almost everything was wrong. And almost everything is locked in step with the CCP approach to the pandemic. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. we just adopted that. And my fear is that Australia is on the path, if not already there, to becoming a simple vassal state of a global medical bureaucratic elite that are going to tell us how to do our own thing in the coming years. Uh, and if that doesn't frighten people, let's have a think back to what we saw in Melbourne and other parts of the country exactly. over the last mm -hmm. two or three years. We, we, we do not want this and people need to understand what's going on. But Rita. surely the World Health Organisation, as you've said, throughout the pandemic, it, it, its mishandling was uh, profound from start to finish. And now uh, North Korea has been admitted, a country that starves its own people, <laughs> sends entire families to labour camps. How can we possibly be trusting this organisation now that we know just how completely shambolic it is and, and how harmful it can be? Like, how is the Liberal Party not recognising this, let alone Labor? 
Well, look, I mean, I think there are there are uh, uh, you know, portions of the party that are, and I'd like to see more. I, I think part of the problem is that people are distracted. You know, li literally, as I said, the bread and circuses of politics is taking our focus off what is the most important issue. And you're quite right. These are um, these are almost comedy acts of hilarity. We've got uh, you know the UN Human Rights Council that's got such human rights heavyweights as Venezuela and Saudi Arabia sitting on its uh, on its advisory panel. I mean, you know, the, the UN has become almost so comical that they should start their own Adelaide Fringe Act next year. <laughs> um, it's, it's almost parody. It's like a, it's like a Babylon B skit now. It's so, so ridiculous. But, look, that's the nature of global politics now. It's almost like this is being slipped under the carpet. Uh, people won't, uh, won't hear about it. They won't talk about it. When you raise it in Senate estimates, like I did during the week, you get told, oh, no, there was nothing to see here. It's all fine. Trust us. Uh, it won't become binding on Australia. And, of course, it will. Once these um, regulations are adopted, they simply have to pass through the parliament here in, in, in Australia. And how hard do you reckon that's going to be? It'll pass through in a breeze. And, so and this also, is the Alex, problem. You, these things are, are real. You made the point, Alex, that uh, we sign up to these treaties. Once we've signed up to them, that becomes the justification for whatever it is. So governments go, yeah, we're doing this because we had to sign the treaty. And you made that point during the week. So let's just, just explain to people very clearly, because there's a lot of misinformation around this. I remember last year, right. just before the May election, in The Spectator, we ran an article saying that Australia was about to sign up to the global uh, uh, pandemic treaty. Scott Morrison, within an hour was on 2GB saying this is a pack of lies, it's conspiracy theory, it's not true, etc, etc, etc. And the reality is, which was, which was misinformation on his part to a degree, because the reality is there are various instruments, as you say, there are various levels, there's amendments going through. Every May there's this World Health or mm. Assembly, which is different to the World Health Organisation, but it's a sub-part of it, a subset of it. They make these little amendments, things get signed, things get changed, then there's this bit over here and that bit over there. It's very deliberately kind of obscure, very bureaucratic, lots of so no one quite knows what's going mm. on. Mm. So explain to us the fear is, now whether this is the reality, but the fear is that in the most extreme cases, if all these amendments go through and if everyone signs up to them, that you would have the global, the World Health Organization being able to declare that a, tree, uh, that a pandemic or an illness has happened in such and such a place and the World Health Organization deciding a lockdown must take place in that area. That's the fear. Now, governments, politicians say, no, 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 that would never happen. But that is the fear, correct? Yeah, you've, you've nailed it, Rowan. Yeah, that's exactly right. And, um, of course, the, the argument against this is, well, if it's not going to become binding and it's not so dr drastic and it's not so important, then why are we doing it? Why are we even involved? Why are we one of these 197 member states that's, that's just whistling Dixie on this, you know, so to speak? It's, uh, it doesn't make any sense, and you're absolutely right. Once these things are in force, they then can be used as hooks for the external affairs powers to create local laws as well. So it's, not, it's just not right to say that this won't be binding on Australia. There are multi-levels of why these will be binding. The international health regulations, once amended and then ratified by the Australian Parliament, do become binding. And then in addition to that, any new treaty obligations become an opportunity for the Australian Parliament to legislate in its own right. So, you know, we, I'm not saying this is the case, but we we may well see the, uh, you know, World Health Organisation Power Shift Bill of 2024, which is tied to the external affairs power under the pa pandemic treaty. Yeah, I'm being facetious, but yes. those are the sorts of things that, that happen under the cover of darkness, James. So, yeah. Uh, Alex, just, right. just, just want to ask you finally, um, do you find it disturbing that there's so much more enthusiasm, not just in Australia, but globally, for a WHO treaty that could control how com countries respond to pandemics, which, of course, are being told, you know, could come again you know, more and more oh, yes. of them were always told this. And yet there's no real global push for a ban on the gain-of-function research that is increasingly believed to have been <laughs> behind the coronavirus pandemic and that is believed to have been partially funded, at least, by Anthony Fauci's National Institutes of Health. Well, I mean, James, you're spot on. I mean, if you're really being serious about a global health, uh, you know, perspective or whatever the, you know, words that are being used in the in the WHO's memos on this is, that you'd think that would be the starting point. The, the, the function which actually started, potentially started the entire pandemic should be front and centre. But I think this bells the cat on what we're dealing with with the World Health Organisation here. We're not... We're not, re we're not really dealing with... This is about power and control and surveillance, ultimately. And they will be saying that is dressed up as a streamlined mm -hmm. approach. But, uh, you know, I reckon Australia's health 
um, you know, framework should be left to do its own thing, to make its own decisions and to not get lockstep with a global unelected bureaucratic elite, which is where we're headed. Now, Alex, just quickly before you go, um, uh, next time you're in Senate Estimates, I have here a bunch of garlics and garlic cloves, uh, uh, genuine. I would like you to ask Brendan Murphy if he can explain whether we could have avoided all of COVID if we just had more garlic, <laughs> which is uh, what the latest news I, we saw I, in I, the Financial I, Review, Alex. I think I think you're. Uh, that's uh, somewhat alarming that you're being facetious, and that's a question I actually did pose to Paul Kelly, Professor <laughs> Paul Kelly, who's the uh, chief health officer. I actually did ask him that question because, and we wish him well. He does have COVID at the moment, uh, but I, uh, you know, and I, I, you know, of course, pointed out that of course the vaccines were working well. Uh, yeah. which I was shot down for, but, uh, you know, throw, throw a bit of garlic at it, Coast. That's, that's what the Doherty Institute now says, and if we'd only exactly. known garlic would fix it, we could have all gone home in 2021. How about that? Exactly. Alexander, great to see you, as always. Keep up the great work there in Parliament with your colleagues there.